Hi, Wayne Dorban here for the bi-weekly NTP Seed webinar huddle that we hold here at our Northern Colorado headquarters in Loveland, Colorado, both live here at our site and also going out over the web to those of you that are watching. Enjoy what we have for you today. I am not live today from Loveland, Colorado. I'm actually live from the, the Philadelphia area, actually in Delaware, across the river from Philadelphia, where I'm out here on a project. John Nillen is actually right there in our new headquarters area in Colorado. Jennifer Orlowski is going to be our guest today, and we have lost her signal here for a second. So in a second, I'm sure she'll come back. I see John's looking at his uh, questions there that we had. How are you doing today, John? I'm doing well. How is, how's the trip going? It's great. It's really good. I had an interesting ride up on I-25 today. Um, I noticed a little panic when I walked in the door here, but I was I got a good view of the highway for 25 minutes, dead stop in traffic, but made it safe and sound and uh, caused a little dirt on your road leading up here to the new office, but uh, we made it. All right, and it looks like Jennifer's back on. At least I, I see a image, and, and we'll see if she shows up here in just a second. But um, real quick, while we're waiting for Jennifer, um, this is our first of our webinars in our new location. Um, we're actually now consolidated. We've got all of our activity up at the ranch, um, and so John's sitting in our new um, ranch office. And as I said, I'm in, in Delaware. So you can see a few videotapes there in the background that, uh, that we have. Um, Leanne is, is producing, and so she's behind the scenes there in the, in the location. And John, can, can anybody else that's there uh, live, can they hear us also, or, or are you having to use just the local speakers? Nope, we're fine. I think um, who's ever here can hear us just fine, so it's coming across well. Awesome. So we've got a... a, a small live audience there in Colorado as we always have for our huddles. Wayne, we've got Jennifer on speakerphone here. Jennifer, can we hear you? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Hi, Wayne. I, I hear her great. So that's actually working awesome. Jennifer, welcome. Thank you for, uh, for being able to come on with us today. We appreciate it. And even though we had a little technical glitches here, um, it's going to be fun. Well, Jennifer, again, welcome. And uh, we appreciate you being with us today. Sorry for these uh, little technical glitches, but uh, over time we'll we'll get them hammered out, and uh, hopefully uh, everything will run smooth in the future. So, but again, we apologize, and uh, but let's get started. Um, okay. Jennifer, um, I guess it says read a little bit of your bio, and then perhaps you can tell us a little bit about yourself. But you were born in New York, born and raised in Central New York, um, received your doctorate in. And uh, this is a new word for me, so hopefully I pronounce it right. Nat naturopathic medicine from Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine in Tempe, Arizona. Is that correct? That's right. Recently received your Certified Nutrition Specialist Certificate, your CNS, in June of 2013. And currently hold a naturopathic medicine license in the state of Vermont. And, uh, and as New York has yet to pass this type of license. Um, and so you're also a professor at SUNY Empire State College where she teaches nutrition and other health-based classes, a position you have held for the last three years. Congratulations. Sounds like uh, you're having a lot of fun with exactly what you enjoy doing. Perhaps uh, maybe tell us a little bit about yourself before we get into some of the direct questions. Okay, well, I, well right now I have an eight-year-old and we homeschool him. So I'm home, actually part of the time I'm home with him half the week, and then I'm actually doing naturopathic medicine the other half. And then out here we are out in the country, which is why I wonder, was wondering what some of the technical difficulties might be. It's our internet. I don't know. But um, you know, right here we have our chickens, and I do my gardening as much as I can in terms of doing as much food as I can grow. Sometimes it works out well, sometimes not. And then, um, I'm not sure, I think... I'm never very good at talking about myself, so I'm not sure what else you would like to know um, in that regard. I, I know she's not hearing me, but why don't you just ask ask her to talk a little bit about her practice, her, her naturopathic practice, and, and, and how that's going for her and what kinds of things she does. So Jennifer, perhaps um, just give us a little insight into your practice and 
and what you do in your practice and uh, perhaps what led you to go into this, um, this, this career path. So what led me into it, which I didn't realize at the time, was when I was, young, when I was 21, um, much younger than I am now, I uh, ended up having a back surgery. This is a really long, windy road. And this is for most naturopaths. It's usually some health crisis that actually ends up leading them down the path of becoming a naturopathic doctor. And that surgery didn't work out well. And I ended up uh, working with a uh, um, massage therapist who really, at that point, really opened up my eyes to the, the whole idea of personal responsibility and how our choices, in particular food choices or exercise or how we treat our bodies, really impact whether it's our healing, in, in my case, because the surgery, so other than the physical therapy that they offered, there was very little discussion about anything else and how to deal with it. <clears throat> um, but with the massage therapist, he really helped me in terms of knowing how to stretch and what really was the problem wasn't the actual surgery, it was the way the muscles um, tried to compensate from the surgery. So we had to do a lot of work with the muscles. And all, through that path, that actually led me into this whole concept of naturopathic medicine and what it is and, and wanting to go and do more and learn more about it and leading them down to school. So I went to school, which is four years of undergrad and then four years of postgrad, which is basically the naturopathic medicine. There's a lot of... Um, which we can get into later, but there's a lot of misunderstanding about naturopaths and who we are and what we do. A lot of people think we're witch doctors, which I get regularly called here in Syracuse. Not so much in other surrounding areas, but in New York, it's, um, Syracuse is probably one of the um, more conservative cities, as it's like Albany, or not Albany, but well, Albany, New York City, Buffalo, Rochester, they're much more open to what we have to offer. And it mostly comes from, my, my opinion, lack of education in, in what, what we do and how we're trained. And in my practice, we will start from the, especially in New York, because where training allows us to do primary care work in states that license us. That's what holding my license in Vermont means. Those of us who are in unlicensed states tend to hold our license in a state that licenses us, which allows us basically what our training does, which is primary care. And the licensure laws are different with different states, but in Vermont, we're covered by Medicaid. We can do primary care work. We can order labs and interpret them, and we're basically part of the medical system, just more what, what most people would term an, an integrative MD. But our work is far more fine than that. We look at, we use a concept called functional medicine. So if someone comes in to see me, let's say for thyroid, for example, and they have a thyroid issue that they would like to treat naturally. That natu as a naturopath, we don't, we are not unopposed to using medications if it's indicated for the person. But thyroid, when this happens a lot, someone will get on thyroid medication, but they don't feel better. Their symptoms are not better. So our job is to really look at the intricacies of the biochemistry and physiology of how this affects somebody. Or their thyroid. So, for example, if you're under a lot of stress, that can affect how your body utilizes the thyroid hormone. Or if your digestion is weak, which for many of us this is true, and you're not absorbing your minerals as well, you have some mineral deficiencies, that can affect the conversion in the tissues of how your thyroid works. So while your brain, in terms of the blood work that they do, shows that your, yes, your levels are normal, it's not showing how your body is utilizing it in terms of the... Um, being able to use it and create the function or the aspect of that particular, for example, thyroid hormone. So our job is to unravel all of this and figure out for that person what is causing their symptoms and how is the best way through working with their physiology to help bring them back to balance. And this really ties in for us. I do a lot of my work through food. Um, and I know you guys with the, you do a lot of like sustainable farming and things like that, right? That's what you promote? Yes. Yeah, this is so important because people have no idea or they're very uneducated about how much their food impacts their health. So, for example, you know, for us, like for me, I'm going to look at their food, what they're in, how is it balanced, um, what types of for meat in particular, what type of meats are they taking in versus organic versus um, conventional meat. And a lot of people, you know, they get upset over organic and they think it's... Uh, 
I think it's a farce, which is unfortunate, and it's mostly due to lack of knowledge because cow is not just organic, and it's really about what they're fed, the same way as our food is about what the nutrients of the soil look like and the microflora. But for an easy example is, is cows, and when cows are fed corn, which is not their natural diet, they can raise something, there's a lot of omega-6s, and it raises something called arachidonic acid, which is very inflammatory. Um, and when they eat all that corn, so when you eat that cow that has all this high level of arachidonic acid, it can then increase your inflammatory markers. And this is unfortunately where I feel red meat um, and some saturated fats, because I am not on the bandwagon that saturated fats are bad, but saturated fats have gotten a bad name. Because they are, when you eat that animal that's been fed wrong, not according to its natural diet, it has great impact on its health and then has impact on the person who eats that animal. Where a free-range cow who's eating mostly grasses and able to go out and eat what it's, its natural diet, its fatty acid profile is completely different and does not have the health effects that a conventional raised cow might have. And all of this, so looking at their food and their food intake and where, if it's processed and how much and then the balance of it all starts to play into their health. And a lot of times when I start, I usually work with GI or digestion. And then just changing their diet, doing small changes, um, will bring dramatic changes in how their, their symptoms. A lot of symptom resolution can happen and then that slowly starts to help me weed out which, what's going on that causes these symptoms for them. And in New York, it's a little bit more challenging um, working here and as opposed to if I was in a licensed state where I had free reign of both my language because I can't say things that are considered medical or diagnosing. And also my tools, which is looking at different labs and looking at them functionally. Looking at somebody in a range, where are they in this range of what, what you know, your, for diabetes, for example, until you surpass a certain blood sugar range, which keeps changing, but we'll say 110 at this point, um, <clears throat> you're not considered diabetic and there's no intervention being talked to, usually for the people, or maybe there's a little bit, depends on where, where the person is and their doctor. For us, we're going to start looking at the whole cascade. That, you know, when someone's blood, blood pressure starts rising or with their um, cholesterol starts to rise, before all those rise before the glucose tends to rise, we're going to start implementing some changes in their diet long before hopefully they become diabetic. And that will hopefully help to shift their physiology depending on them because everybody is very up to the individual. That's very interesting. Could you tell us a little bit about perhaps what type of courses and the training that you receive to get your degree in naturopathic so medicine? The, um, for a course work, it's four years. Well, it's four years full time, so basically it amounts to six years. We do 4,500 hours of clinical training or classroom training, excuse me, and then 1,500 hours of supervised clinical training, which is under we have clinics that we go to and we train under both MDs and MDs. And some people will do chiropractors and acupuncturists. And then the basic sciences, the first two years of our um, education is basic sciences, which is going to be anatomy. We do anatomy lab. Um, physiology, histology, microbiology, biochemistry, and we get actually quite a substantially more, usually about 100 hours more in physiology. Um, and then pharmacology, because we do, in some states we're able to uh, order scripts, so we, and plus we need to know that for drug herb or drug supplement interaction, and then pathology. Usually, because we have to take board exams, just like medical doctors, so we usually, there's two board exams. There's a basic science, so we usually we take that board exam two years into our education, and then the clinical board exam is at the end. And then the next two years, generally speaking, are depending on our clinical discipline. So we're going to get into diagnostic medicine, imaging, laboratory classes, clinical diagnosis, differential diagnosis functional medicine assessment, and then we get into our modality. So as naturopaths, we are trained in nutrition, botanical medicine. Um, in Arizona, where I went to school, we're also trained in acupuncture. That isn't all of the um, naturopathic medical colleges don't do that because the licensure is different. But we get 
physical medicine, which is basically chiropractic, just like it's a little bit different. It's called naturopathic physical medicine, I believe. Hydrotherapy, homeopathy, um, and mind-body medicine. These are all the modalities that we're then trained in. And our job is to then, and then on top of that, we do our 1,500 hours in the clinic. And in the clinic is where we bring all of this information together, where we have to learn how to assess somebody, not just on you have X, Y, Z symptoms, your lab work says this, so now you have this disease, but we want to know why you have that disease, what's happening in your physiology. And then we take the modalities and apply to that person. Each person is different. And we then want to start to say, okay, we're going to do this. Let's say we will make a dietary change. And we're going to start to work on and start to give you, let's say I'll give you some supplements to try to shift your own physiology back to its balance. And we may also start to recommend, for us, we want to look at the whole picture. And so there are some of us who will specialize, which isn't me, more in like the mind-body connection I'll refer out. But looking at like the mind and how the emotions and the mental state is contributing to their illness. So, for example, I have a client right now who's having trouble getting pregnant. She has tremendous stress. So we need to work with her stress level to help her reduce them with the endocrine effects of that stress that it's pushing because otherwise she's completely normal so she's frustrated as to why she's not getting pregnant as far as the medical community is concerned. So then this is where all of our training is. And I think a lot where the misconception comes in both with medical community and the public is there's, um, I think, I think actually they may both be shut down now, but I'm not 100% percent sure. But the, um, these, there's these online programs that people can go and take, and it's not nearly the expense, expensive training that we go through, where they can, I don't even know, maybe it's a year, two years, I'm not even sure, where they can take these online classes, and at the end of it, they can then call themselves a doctor of naturopathic medicine. And I think that's where a lot of confusion comes in. Is people, a lot of doctors presume that is our training, and that is, and of course, I myself would agree with them. I feel frustrated at times when people are making medical assessments or things that they really shouldn't do because people are, with their health, they're very nervous. It's really easy to take advantage of somebody or make them really nervous unnecessarily or things like that. Um, but that is not our training. There's five. Now, when I went to school, there's only three schools in the U.S., but now there's five. One is still an accreditation. So meaning it's not fully accredited yet. And then there's two, I think it's two or three in Canada, and that's it for the whole Northeast, or the North America. Um, so it's growing. Naturopathic medicine is starting to get more. There's a lot more people who want to be naturopaths, and then there's a, obviously by the, the growth of the schools. It shows that. Does that help explain what our oh, education is? Tremendously. And uh, give folks an example. Um, just how many graduates are there a year between the three schools or the five schools? I have, uh, I don't know. <laughs> but when I graduate, which is 10 years, it's got to be now. It's got to be several hundred. Several hundred? Graduating every year. Uh -huh. yeah, it's, not, it's not like medical school. We, as part of the reason we don't have the numbers yet to, uh, to compete well, medically um, with the medical doctors in terms of how many of us. But it's just every year there's more and more graduates. I mean, when I first went, or like the classes, classes were maybe 40, 50 people. By the time I graduated, the classes had doubled in size already in terms of how there's probably 100 in the classes. And I don't know about the schools up north. That was our school. Our school was newer than the two out west. Um, they're much older. Been around like, for a long time. For a while, like even in New York, we had naturopathic colleges and we had naturopathic homeopathic hospitals, but they shut all those down. Probably somewhere between 100 and 50, you know, 100 or so years ago. Um, unfortunately, it was more of a political issue back then that caused that. Uh -huh. Famous chiropractors. So let's do this now. Let's take you back a little bit. When you were 15 years old, on a beautiful Saturday afternoon, what would we have found? What would you have found yourself doing? Oh, I'd be, I'd be outside. That's always what I'm doing. <laughs> outside, I'm swimming, I'm doing something, hiking at the beach. That's what, usually what I'm doing. And usually with a book. Back then, I did a lot of reading. I still do, actually. Quite a bit of reading. Ask Jennifer what uh, 
at what point in her life did she think at all about medicine before she had some of the physical issues she described? Did she, did she even think that this would be a career path at all? Well, I was asking a very good question. That is, had you given any thought before you had your own medical issues of going into the medical field in any way, shape, or form? No, in fact, prior to that, I was doing marine biology. <laughs> you were into mar marine biology, okay. Yeah. yeah, prior to that, and then this happened, this um, bad thing happened, it really shifted and altered my path. Um, made it difficult to do some of the marine biology type work, which was more field work is where I was after. Um, it just, that's how that happened, but no, not prior to that, no, that was not where I was heading. Well, when... <laughs> I saw Wayne smile as soon as you said marine biology. The two of you could have a marine biology discussion forever as, as Wayne was trained and went to Scripps. So I think uh, that's, that's another uh, a webinar that we could have for another day. So uh, where, uh, where did you train in marine biology? I was um, University of Florida in Gainesville. I was working for the USGS for a little while there, and they started paying for my... Um, graduate work in it, and you know, it was shortly into it I had to stop, so I didn't get very far in terms of the actual work, but that was, that's really where my heart is, is in the ocean. John, would you, ask, um, would you ask Jennifer how much nutrition study in her naturopathic degree program that she had a normal position in a in a typical MD program would have today. I know in the past, MDs didn't even have nutrition. Jennifer, I don't know if you could hear Wayne, and uh, he was asking how much nutritional education and courses and training did you receive versus, let's say, versus the, the typical uh, medical doctor in today's yeah, you know, education? Our, we have over 200 hours, um, plus all of plus everything we do in terms of the clinical training is always nutrition because we're always talking about diet. Without changing someone's diet, it's impossible to help balance their physiology because it is our food that is causing a lot of the chronic illnesses that people suffer with today. So, you know, while we have 200 plus hours in classroom, it's that's just constant in our training. That's all we ever talk about is nutrition. Now, an MD. I hear it's anywhere from the zero hours. I'm not in their program. I haven't looked them up specifically, but they get zero hours to maybe 10 or a class here or there. I think it varies, and I, I do think there's some change in there, but unfortunately they're so inadequately prepared, which is where a lot of the um, difficulty comes in in communicating because a lot of, like I'll have GI docs say food has nothing to do with people's GI symptoms, which to me, if you just think of it logically, that doesn't even make sense. If you're having a lot of GI symptoms, what's the main thing always interacting with your GI system? Food. So, or I'll have doctors say, when I, let's say, for example, gluten is a big one that causes a lot of trouble for people. If I have someone remove gluten, they'll tell them that I'm going to create a nutritional deficiency. Well, that's not true because if someone eats a whole foods diet, they're getting plenty of nutrients. That might be true for a standard American who's eating processed foods and things like that, but that's not true from somebody who's eating a healthy whole food diet. So just from a nutrition standpoint, for the normal human being, what kind of a diet would you suggest as far as intake, types of foods, um, things that you, know, you would recommend with your training that people stay away from uh, and what people should a consume? That is a loaded question. <laughs> that is a loaded question. That is, wow. Well, so, from my perspective, is, like I always start with a base, and it's going to be a low glycemic, making sure you get six to, anywhere six to 12, ideally, servings of vegetables, two more fruit, making sure everyone gets at least two servings of beans. I think we should be eating saturated fats. That's something that I think will start to change. There is some new research coming out that they're not as bad as they thought they were, but saturated fats make up, are what primarily make up our brain and nerves. Um, so making sure they have good, healthy fat, because we're eating a lot of polyunsaturated, and that's creating a lot of trouble. Um, and then really looking at, for each person, you got to look at their individual food sensitivities. And this is really due to our environment and the amount of drugs people take or antibiotics that they're consuming, whether it's through the doctor or whether it's through their food. Um, 
really disrupting our GI physiology. So it's creating a lot of food sensitivities, except for gluten, actually. I think gluten the discussion all into its own. It really creates problems. I know there's a lot of resistance, and now lately they're coming out saying gluten-free is not what they're saying it is, but but they're taking it out of context. Um, there's definitely some downsides to gluten-free, but if you eat a healthy diet, those downsides are not really, that's just a moot point. Um, it's not really an issue anymore. So it's looking at that, and I actually think people should be on a much lower carb diet. I often get my clients down to one to three servings of grains, not the six to 11 or wherever they're at now. It's way too high. We do not have the exercise and the energy expenditure as an average person. Some people do and give you higher carb amounts, but most of us do not. And so that having that much glucose in our blood is create, obviously creating a lot of problems as our diabetic, diabetes, diabetic and obesity epidemic is just getting worse. Because we have way too much sugar and carbohydrates in our diet. John, would you ask uh, Jennifer She's getting any kind of cooperation from the standard medical community in, in terms of what she's doing, or is it is it still a pretty much resistant circumstance? Wait, excellent question. What uh, what type of cooperation are you getting from the you know the the regular quote unquote medical community as far as your practice and what you're doing? Well, huh. not much. Um, unfortunately, and, and I, that I think is really a reflection of um, demographics. I think it's the area therapy is an extremely difficult area. I'm also in New York. If I was in a licensed state, I think while it would still be kind of like chiropractors, where there's some of the doctors accept them, but nowadays most of them do. Some don't. I mean, and most of them do. So that's more like in a licensed state how we would be received, but. Especially, especially unlicensed states and especially Syracuse because it's very conservative. Um, although there is some shifting going on. Um, I am, I, some people are really, uh, do not like me like that. Some, there's a couple MDs that are really supportive of me and will help me out because I have to work with the medical community because if I need labs, I need to work with them. Some of them are fairly neutral. Um, and, you know, from when I first, because I've been here almost 10 years now, well, maybe not nine, actually, um, nine years. Um, but from when I first got here, it's definitely improving. So there is a there is a shift. There is a paradigm shift going on. Unfortunately, I think there's a lot of medical doctors who want to do integrative medicine. And while it's great, it's, unfortunately, it's not the same as functional medicine, unless they actually are trained in functional medicine, integrative they tend to overshoot, and they're not looking for physiologic balance, which is very different. That's the key. It's physiologic balance, which means you don't give high doses of lots of hormones, or like we do, we just tweak it a little bit to try to see what the body can do itself, because our bodies are amazing. They are not as frail as I think a lot of people think they are. They have incredible ability given the right tools and the right nutrients, just like gardening or animals or anybody, anything out in nature, if it has its, what, the right tools, the right nutrients, they flourish. And the same is true for us humans. We have to give our, feed ourselves the right food and we will flourish. And our bodies can self-correct. It's like I'm sure, uh, although I don't have any training in this, but I'm sure ecosystems will self-correct given the right, the right ingredients of the oil as well. Give our listeners a little bit of uh, some insight into uh, someone who might have influenced you into, uh, you know, your career path now or, you know, when you were younger, someone who had a major impact on what led you, you know, perhaps into this field of study and, yeah, and practice. Yeah, I'm a massage therapist, the one that helps me with my back. He's the one that really impressed upon me personal responsibility, and that's something that I work a lot with with my own clients. And it took a while for me to get it back then, certainly at that age. And, you know, personal responsibility is something that I think we need to talk about more in our society, and meaning that we have to stop blaming on everybody else. But if I choose this food, I'm going to have this effect. And that's something that's been so empowering in my practice, is uh, when people, let's say, they remove gluten, 
and they feel so much better. Now when they eat gluten, they realize, oh, my headache is from the gluten. So when they eat gluten again, they get a headache. And so it's their, their health symptoms are less um, scary because now they can figure out why they're getting them. And he was just really prominent in that. And now we're looking back, hindsight 2020, but he just in general really helped me understand how important it is for us to take responsibility for our own health and look at our choices. And for me, it was really, he also talked to me a lot about food. I don't know if he realized how much he influenced me, but he had a huge influence on me. Dr. Weston Price has also has a huge influence on, on me, especially more recently. He's not, he's not alive anymore, but his work more recently and really looking at food. He was a dentist. I can't remember exactly when he was alive, but I want to say in the, maybe in the 1920s. I don't know. I'm not sure on that. But um, he really had some powerful information. I mean, he noticed how certain people about our jaw structure and ended up realizing that it was related to our food. And he went and studied um, traditional cultures and what they were eating and basically came down to the idea that we, you know, we need nutrient-dense by food. And what does that mean? And there's this whole organization now that's really promoting his work. Um, and that is truly, that's truly the key to health, is having good quality food. That's where it starts. That's the building blocks. From a, a quality of food standpoint, would you say what is sold in the, the everyday grocery store across the United States is okay? No. No? We're not. I would say what's sold in the farmers markets, what's sold at your local farmers. It's like I live, like I said, I live in the country. There's tons of farmers around here who have little farm stands. What's grown in my garden, even the big. Me, I personally don't believe in the big organic. Um, you can, I mean, if you grow your own garden, you can clearly see the color difference in the food. I mean, just even your own garden. Um, my my son doesn't. Really dislikes it when our broccoli. We don't have broccoli anymore because it's just not the same coming from the store. So while you know, for a lot of people, this upsets people because a lot of people are like, "Well, I don't have the time," or "Don't see your business." But I am a firm believer in do the best you can. You know, bless your food and do the best you can, but really start paying attention to the quality of the food you get. Um, I have a local farmer up the road that we get our milk from. He's able to do raw milk, and whenever I like my friends who are now also drinking it, you, you can taste the difference in the quality of his milk versus what you get in the store. So I think the stores, you know, they do the best that they can. It's, I think it's complicated. It's easy for me to say, no, it's not. It's definitely not the best quality, but I think it's complicated. There's, you know, they're trying to feed a lot of people. But again, this comes back to personal responsibility. I want better quality food, so I'm going to put that time and effort into going to my farmer's market finding my local farmers, or um, growing my own food. I mean, right up the road, we have a guy who's making meat, there's black Angus cows, and those cows are outside every day of the year. I get to watch how they're raised and which they have a very happy, healthy life. Um, so that's, I think, key, and I think a lot of us need to start, I think there is a movement towards that, but I think a lot of us need to start thinking about that. So moving forward then, as you, you know, you look at your practice and and where you're headed. Perhaps give our you know listeners a a key skill that you have learned that you are using and like from the past, and it's influencing you now in the way you you know you you run your business and you you know run your practice. Balance and personal responsibility. Those are the those are key skills and learning how to have balance and and that means with our food and our food intake and you know a lot of people because of what I do, I really have to help, you know, people are changing their whole lifestyle and it's not easy and it's not going to be fast and sometimes they're going to have gluten or a food they know bothers them and it's not about good or bad. Or bad. You know, it's about, you know, we have to eat healthy as the primary base of our diet, but we also have to have balance because the stress of sometimes being healthy is just as detrimental as eating bad food. So balance is huge and that's true for me in my practice. My work life, my home life, um, is really focusing on balance to keep us healthy. And then personal responsibility comes down to choice. Um, that, well, again, both in my business and, and working with clients and, and on both sides of the fence, me as the doctor and 
am I helping them in the way that they need? I have to always look at that. I can't feel frustrated if somebody quits. I have to look at, too. I mean, sometimes it's them and sometimes it's me. It's really looking at, you know, really taking that to heart. Not in a, a self-defeating way, but really looking at that so you can be better for the next person who might come down your path. Let me throw another question at you and uh, tell our listeners what, what does the term sustainability mean to you? Sustainability, like, I think, like, just a, it just means, I don't know how to best describe this. I, I struggle with that question, actually. Just in ecology, it means, you know, diversity and having the, the flourish, the, the ecology, the you know, ecosystem to be able to give the biodiversity and the diversity of animals, in that particular case, or, or species, and the whole system will thrive. And I think that that is really what sustainability is about, is for all of us, whether it's in our food, really looking at the impact that we might have if we're going to uh, take something out of balance in our life with we like too much sugar or too much carbs, it really just comes back to balance in the end. And really looking at, do we have a balanced diet or balanced nutrients? And whether that's in our health or in our environment or in our world, I think sustainability is really all about looking at balance, looking at how we're impacting whether it's us or our environment through our choices and educating ourselves. I really feel today, you know, if someone gives you information with the Internet and what it's, it's the power of information and knowledge that the Internet allows us, it, we can do a whole lot more than... Um, some of us like to think we can. And through research, it's so easy to get information today on how to make changes, again, both for our environment and for our health. Because without our environment, sustainability, and looking at that as well, and this comes down to food choice. If you don't have you know, healthy raised cows, for example, don't have as great of an impact on the environment as the factory farm cows. So related to that, has there been one person who's been, you know, very influential on you in the sustainability or environmental area as far as an example of nutrition or helping you farm or helping you, you know, you know, grow your garden? Has there been one person who, you know, you learned from or, or you said, well, I, they're really good at that or I want to pattern myself after them? <laughs> My dad helped, has helped me a lot with gardening and my chickens and stuff. And I know he's not in the movement per se but he's had a huge impact on me and helping me and my local farmers and um, talking to, you know, people locally. That really, for me, has probably had the most impact is getting that local knowledge um, through community. And then, you know, in the in my, in my practice movement, it really is less than price. I don't know if that would be, you know, part of the, what you're looking for in that answer, but he really had, I think, would be right in that, if he was alive today, would be right in that movement. His whole philosophy is about nutrient dense food. I know when we started, uh, we started off our conversation today, you mentioned that you you enjoyed reading, and uh, you do a lot of reading. So yeah. maybe give our listeners a, what, what's a, what's a book you, uh, you've read recently or you're reading today that people might be interested well, in? right now I'm reading The Low Carb Diet, Low Carb, I believe, and Know Your Fat which are great books, Know Your Fat, especially because it's written by a biochemist, Mary Ng. Um, and so it gives them the, the real information on fat and what happens with the demonization of fat because I feel that really is contributing to our health effects, our health issues today as a society, is the low fat grade. But everyone needs to do their own research. Um, so that's a great book to start with. And then the low carb, the art of low carb, the art and science of low carb, I think it is, which is great. And understanding why low carb is important. And low carb doesn't mean like some of the ketogenic or paleo. I don't really like to get into that. I just realizing that we need to match carb consumption with output. Otherwise, it turns into insulin issues and fat and obesity and diabetes. So really understanding the science of that. Um, and then from a more... I also like, and what really has, well, there's a lot of books that have come since this, but it is really The Power of Now by Effort Tolley and The New Earth, which was really my first introduction into the concept of the ego. And I think that's the more that people understand about ego, the less threatening and intimidating and the less 
negative human interactions um, will be had. So I think those are really important for in just growth as, as a whole. Leading from that, is there a particular phrase or a quote, perhaps from one of those books or from someone that you remember that means a lot to you and you kind of yeah, use in your life? Yeah, it's not from uh, one of those books, but um, it's actually a phrase that I use a lot with my business, and it's by Thomas Edison. His quote is, the doctor of the future will give no medicine, but will interest his patients in the care of the human frame, in diet, and in the cause and prevention of disease. And that, I think, is so important for all of us. Instead of jumping, not that we may not need medicine, medicine medication, drugs, but if we take care of ourselves and we learn how to take care of ourselves, it's really not taught at all, ever. Um, it just has tremendous benefits. It spiders out, not just in our health, but you know, we feel better and we can give back to our community and you know, we're, we're happier, healthier people. But I like Thomas Edison when he said that. Yeah, I think he had a little impact on our society. Yep, he did. <laughs> One other question we always uh, we like to ask our folks who come on the huddles, and it's a question um, that Wayne has stolen from a gentleman by the jo name of John Lee Dumas, and he hosts a popular webcast daily. It's called Entrepreneur on Fire, and he asks every guest, and it's a it's a good one. And here it is: If you woke up tomorrow. And you found you were on another planet, just like Earth, and all of your daily needs were cared for. But all you have is your laptop and five hundred dollars. What would you decide to do for the next seven days? Well, that'd be easy. I put the laptop away because I don't think I'd want to use that, and I would be outside, exploring, looking wherever I landed, going exploring the ecosystem and the nature and the life out there. I'm not even sure I'd need the money, maybe to buy some food or something. But you mean we'd go shopping at the farmers market? Yeah, if they had one, yep. <laughs> I could buy food. Oh, I um, I am an outdoors girl. I like to be outside. Doesn't matter where I am, as long as it's outside. And so, if you're outside that much, what what are your winters like? They're cold. Yeah. They are cold. They weren't so cold up until this year, though. They weren't so bad. You could still get outside. I live at the base of a forest. <clears throat> it's actually a park, too, so we can do cross country skiing and mountain or uh, snowshoeing. This is what we do a lot or go sledding. So it's nice. I don't have to drive very far. Jennifer, you certainly have an interesting story. And uh, what you're doing is it's very, very cool. And I'm sure you're helping a lot of people. Let me ask Wayne do you have any other questions for Jennifer Wayne? Oh, I, I have lots of them that I'll reserve to do maybe at another time. I, I'm very intrigued, and, and I just wish her the best. And, you know, it's, it's, it's sad for me to hear that the, the traditional medical community is not embracing what she and all the others like her are doing. Um, and I, yet I understand it totally. And I think she's right when she said that the, the typical MD who comes out of four years of college and four more years of medical school and a residency and whatever other training they have in their particular um, disciplines has had no nutrition training. Um, and yet, what is the whole, what is our body? <laughs> we are what we eat, as they say. And, and um, anyway, I, I so much appreciate what she's doing. I thank her so much for coming on today and, and then primarily even being great with our little technical difficulties. Leanne was able to show some nice clips of her um, and of her website and other things. Does, does she have anything else that she'd like to tell us about her practice or, or just, just anything to end the conversation here? Otherwise, um, see if anyone else, um, either online or they're live, has got any other questions that they might have for her. Jennifer, were you able to um, get most of what Wayne said there? I heard some of it, but I, I don't have anything else to add okay. at this point. Well, you've been a tremendous guest, and I'm sure uh, I, I know that Wayne is going to want to talk with you further about your, um, you know, history, your studies in marine biology, because I know that's a, 
a passion of his, and uh, hopefully, uh, you know, we can get together and hopefully we can have you back another time uh, to join us on a huddle. And uh, we really appreciate it. And I think uh, I know I personally found it very interesting. And I know that uh, as we all get older, no matter how old you are, uh, nutrition and diet seem to be a topic. And I think the more people like yourself are out there promoting it, uh, better off people are going to be and a lot healthier. So thank you. And we are looking for any other questions that may come up on our chat box here. And we, I, I actually don't see anything at the moment. So maybe we will uh, sign off for today. Wayne, any closing words, please? And, uh, oh, by the way, I think we do have Jeff Finkel, the head of the IEDC, which is the International Economic Development Council, um, located, and he is located in Washington, D.C., and uh, he will be our next guest on the huddle in two weeks. Yeah, and that's exciting. He uh, hopefully he'll even tell us a little bit about his jury duty. John, remember he told us the story. He was supposed to have spoken several weeks ago, and and he had to, had jury duty. But Jeff, Jeff's a longtime friend of both John and I's, and we look forward to him. And again, thank you everyone for participating. Again, we know that a lot of you are going to watch this um, on a replay. Um, go back and look at some of the other webinars that we've done. Um, there's been a lot of really great guests, and Jennifer, we just really appreciate you taking the time today. Um, I hope Teresa got to catch a little bit of this. This is she's your friend who introduced us to you, and she's actually traveling today, going moving to Ireland, um, and and hopefully she's able to catch a little bit of this. And if not, she'll catch it as a replay. And thanks everybody, and goodbye from uh, from Delaware. I almost said from Loveland. And John. Take it over and, and, and we'll sign off. And we'll sign off here from beautiful Loveland, Colorado. Again, Jennifer, thank you again for being our guest. Thank you.